Welcome back to Elsinore. Last episode we came to the Royal Gallery, which is where we're at right now, and we read the death report on King Hamlet, and how, although there's no proof that they died suspiciously, or they died from foul play, rather, it was still a very suspicious death. Um, oh, I noticed something. I was looking at the timeline. See, I thought, because we did actually play a little bit from the day before, uh, on Wednesday, today's Thursday, we did play a little bit, just basically a tutorial and introduction kind of thing, and then we went to sleep and had visions of stuff happening, and that's when the game fully started, is today on Thursday. So it looks like uh, this is actually day one. I thought this was day two, because technically it kind of is, but the four days that keep looping, I think, are these four full days. I don't think it includes that sort of half day that we had at the very beginning. I wonder where we're going to loop from. Do you think we... I bet we loop starting from where we're woken up by Hamlet. Or maybe in the future Hamlet won't wake us up, but we start by waking up from that, that nightmare, that vision. That's probably what happens, I bet. Okay. Oh, and I was looking at the map, by the way, and I noticed that this whole section here, which is not where I'm at, I'm here. This whole section is blue, and there's a bunch of people gathered here, so I think this indicates that there's some sort of an event happening. I just wasn't informed about that event. And actually, in the previous ten minutes or so, I guess from clicking around in the menus enough time passed that the event stopped, the kitchen was also blue as well. Some conversation between Irma and Queen Gertrude. But, for now, I'm in the Royal, Royal Gallery, and I want to read some stuff. There's some stuff here. We got the Death Report, but there's Peculiar Tales Volume 2. What's this? Flight of the Executioner. This one's a lot shorter than the other story we read. And so it came to pass that the King of the Realm died one night, leaving his two sons behind. In this savage and warlike country, it was customary that whichever child inherited the crown for himself would immediately kill the others, eliminating further competition. However, these two brothers were twins, born within a scant few moments of one another. And so they brought the matter to High Executioner Selene. They found her standing at the edge of the highest cliff in the kingdom, above the rolling and raging sea. I am twenty seconds older than my brother, said the first prince. Without any doubt at all, I am the rightful heir. Lady Selene, please cast my brother over this cliff immediately. Lady Selene bound the second prince's hands and led him to the edge of the cliff. But the second prince sputtered suddenly. This is wrong. I may be younger, but my brother's body is weak and frail. He becomes sicker each day, and soon he may very well die. Then the kingdom will be left with no heir at all. Don't kill me, kill him. Lady Selene paused to think a moment, then bound the first prince's hands too. The first prince spat with disgust. My brother is a jealous imbecile. Lady Selene wrapped a blindfold around his eyes. The second prince stamped his foot. My brother is a weakling and cannot see reason. As with the first prince, the second prince, too, was soon blindfolded. Both of them continued to argue at the top of their lungs, screaming for the other one's demise. Then the sound of Executioner Selene's fading footsteps caught their attention. High Executioner, come back! You must kill my brother! I must be king! Where are you going? I'm off to pour myself a flagon of wine and then pursue a career change to the next kingdom over. In that order, Selene replied. Sounds like this one's gone a bit rotten. Good luck finding your way home with those blindfolds and binds on, lads. The two men lunged at each other, unwilling to stand down, and the both of them went tipping over the edge, careening into the sea. The kingdom was none the worse for it in the end. That one's much more lighthearted than the first one that we read, which I think was volume four. Oh, here's uh, volume one. Eight signs your nobleman might be treacherous. <laughs> Have you often wondered at the true form and character of your lover? Pay careful mind. Here are eight signs he's foe rather than friend. First, within mere days of your acquaintance, he declares that if you call him but love, he'll be new baptized. 
This nobleman is a walking source of dramatic show, clinging to any poor girl who crosses his path, abnormally likely to meet his end in poison and tears. Second, he uses the term taming or shrew in your presence, or even worse, in the same sentence. If he attempts to starve you to break your will, eat his heart out. Third, he suddenly finds himself madly in love with your closest friend after promising you his undying heart. Keep a sharp eye out for fairy dust in the vicinity. Fourth, he sticks a dagger in your back, then blames it on your ambition. Don't worry, your restless spirit will have revenge. Stay indoors on March 15th, if possible. Five, after you help him murder his friends and cover up the crimes, he begins embarrassing you with inappropriate sobbing at your dinner parties. Even the most hardening prophecy can't revive this relationship. Six, he tells you your wife has been unfaithful, but offers flimsy proof. Take a walk, enjoy some deep breathing, and stay away from pillows. Seven, he tries to convince you to kill your brother. One might think this clear as day, yet this author is continually surprised. 8. Sometimes he tells you to get to a nunnery. Other times he tells you, he did love you once. Which is it? Send this uncouth boy sulking back to university. This all seems so trivial, but I can't stop reading. So that's volume one and two, and I think we read four in our room. So where's volume three? This is the missing portrait. Yep. The late King Hamlet's portrait used to be here, but someone, uh, Hamlet actually, has gone and torn it off the wall. He's so strange. That's King Alexander, Hamlet's grandfather. He's intimidating. I wonder what happened to him. King Douglas. He was a well-humored man and a scholar, noted for his many contributions to this library, among others. He was a teacher to many, I'm told. That's the late Queen Astrid, Hamlet's grandmother. Come to think of it, I've often heard about King Alexander, but nothing about Queen Astrid. I wonder why. How peculiar. Ooh, that's actually a piece of information that we can talk about. Now believes Queen Astrid was once on the throne. Where the information mysterious Queen Astrid. Lady Edith, often called the Brilliant. She was renowned for her great intellect and keenly inquisitive nature. Not to mention her morbid sense of humor. When I struggled with Latin as a girl, my father often jokingly told me to come down here and ask this portrait for advice. It won't stop throbbing. Oh, uh, it feels as if something's... Oh. Oh dear. This won't do. <sighs> Thank goodness. Father. What happened? You had a fainting spell. You've been asleep. We're fortunate someone saw you collapse and raised the alarm. Who? Uh, some traveling thespian. Uh, Peter Quince, his name was, uh, I think. Here to perform a play for his majesty. Ophelia. You must be more careful. I've called for the court physician, but I don't know how soon he'll be here. If something worse had happened, I... Father. I'm alright. I feel perfectly fine now. <sighs> how wonderfully grateful I am for that. If you see that Quince man, you must thank him profusely. I believe he's putting on a performance in just a few minutes in the Great Hall. If you dress and go now, you'll make the start of it. That would be an opportunity, an opportune time to express your gratitude, don't you think? I'll be there. I've got to attend to His Majesty, but please don't overtax yourself, I beg of you. performance is about to start. I wonder if that's the man my father mentioned. My lady. So terribly good to see you in the land of the living. I... Uh, I must express my most sincere thanks to you, Sir Quince. Please. No, sir. Uh, Peter Quince. 
the one-man thespian. At your service any time, my lady. I'm passing through to put on one of my performances for His Majesty's court. When I saw you collapse earlier, you gave me quite a start. <sighs> Were it not for you, I'm not certain what would have happened. It is rather disarming when one's mortal coil fails one, isn't it? Indeed. On that topic, have you been to Elsinore before? We've had performers at the castle often, but I cannot say I recall your face. I've visited now and then over the years. It is unfortunate I have never made your acquaintance. A coincidence, perhaps. Or fate. Now please, you must excuse me. My performance is about to begin, after all. But if you ever find you need assistance in your endeavors, please do find me. And what endeavors might those be? That's neither here nor there. Suffice to say, there are fascinating things at work in Elsinore Castle. The machine which has been set in motion can no longer be halted. Not now. What the hell does Quince know? They seem to know a lot about what's happening. It will be frightening at first, but then everything will become clear. And then we shall speak further, you and I. It's very ominous. Welcome, one and all! I, your humble playmaster, have arranged a most magnificent show for you tonight. And with my many changing faces, I aim to please all who look upon me. So, without further ado, a tale of tragedy and woe. The Murder of Gonzago! Hmm... I don't think we've seen this one before, have we, my love? Mm. It's not familiar to me, no. Huh. I, for one, am thoroughly excited. Horatio, keep a close eye on Claudius. Watch his face for me. Ah, so what's happening here, from what I remember of the adaptation of Hamlet that I watched, is that what Hamlet was told by the ghost about how their father was murdered by Claudius is that their father was sleeping and Claudius came up to them and put some sort of a poison in their ear and that's what caused their blood to thicken or curdle or whatever it said in the death report. Uh, what Hamlet the Younger planned to do is they had a conversation with the performers and made sure that as part of the play there's uh, an event that is very, very, very similar to how they were told that their father was murdered. They put in a scene where somebody puts poison inside of someone else's ear. And so that's why they're saying keep an eye on Claudius. Because it's a test to see whether they react. They're still not entirely sure that what they heard from the ghost is the truth. Uh, certainly. But why? Ladies and gentlemen. Our tale, my friends, takes us to the fair city of Vienna where King Gonzago and his wife, Baptista, are not so happily wed. Ooh. Jesus Christ, that face is terrifying. That is so scary. My king, let us count a thousand journeys of the sun and moon again before our love be done. Oh. That is so creepy too. Oh, my love, I must leave you soon. My form is weak and frail. And thou shalt live in this fair world behind. <laughs> but never fear. A new husband you shall find. Oh. oh, confound the rest. Loving anyone else would be treason in my breast. Hmm. I think this part... I don't remember this, if this was in the movie or not, but uh, this part seems to be trying to make Queen Gertrude uncomfortable. About marrying... Claudius so quickly. The only women who can love a second husband must surely have killed the first. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Naturally, Gonzago's evil brother, Lucianus, has something more sinister in mind. He plans to steal his brother's crown for himself. Okay, so there's more similarities than just the poison thing. <laughs> 
None of you shall sit upon the throne but I, Lucianus. Lucianus poisons his own brother as he lies sleeping in the garden. Which is exactly what we read from the death report about where uh, King Hamlet was killed in the garden. Her. Die, you old fool, once and for all. No! What do you call this play again, Goethe? I, I, I cannot recall. Oh, my dear. The queen comes across the body of her dead husband. Ooh. My love, my king, please awaken from your slumber and hold me. My love? Why are your lips so pale and your cheeks so white? <laughs> oh, he's dead. What is this performance? Who organized this? Hamlet, stop the performance. Haven't you seen what you meant to... Wait. Here's the important part. Now as king, the evil Lucianus swoops in to retrieve his prize, the queen. <sighs> Come now, Queen Baptista. To the altar we must hurry. <gasps> I protest. I'll never love you. Oh. But... Milady, how can I ever love another after Gonzago? What do you think, mother? <laughs> the lady protests too much. Stop. I need to leave. Claudius. I feel ill. I need to leave now. Cancel the play. My lord. The entire play? Now. Well, that was odd. Hush, Horatio. Everyone, we'll have sweetmeat served in the Grand Hall shortly. Nothing to worry about. I knew it. Did you see his face, Horatio? I'll take that spirit's word for a thousand pounds. I saw it too. He's gone and run off. I'm going to pursue him. I have to know the truth one way or another. For some reason, Claudius was deeply upset by that play. King Claudius becomes upset but will recover overnight. King Claudius no longer wants to placate Hamlet and now wants to avoid Hamlet. King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, and Ophelia now believe that the play targets Claudius. And Ophelia learns about an event in which the king seeks salvation. Ah, so immediately after, they're going to seek salvation? I should go to where they are. In the chapel. Ah, right. Asking for forgiveness in the chapel. Um, what is Lady Guildenstern and Rosencrantz up to in the forest path? Hopefully they're getting up to some gay stuff. I don't actually know, because... Well, towards the second half of the movie, I started skipping a lot of scenes, because I wasn't really that into it. And also, I think they just cut out a lot of these characters from the movie, just for runtime. Like, I don't remember Rosencrantz, or... Maybe Guildenstern? Possibly? Definitely not Rosencrantz. Definitely not Irma, either. I really don't remember them. Anyway. Let's go to the chapel. At least not too awkward that I'm here. I don't know how to do this. Are you even listening, Lord? Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. Even if you cannot forgive me, I can't bear this alone. Not anymore. Ophelia learns more about Claudius coming undone. I killed him. The 
oldest crime and the worst. The castle believes it to be a snake bite which froze his blood as he slept in the garden. But I poured that poison into his ear myself. I remember the feel of it in my hands. I don't deserve anything of his. Not this crown, not my wife, none of it. I know it. I know I was wrong. But in that moment, it, it felt... You know my heart, don't you, Lord? I could see no other way out. I need salvation, yet I am beyond salvation. All those who murder must go to hell, so your divine hand has written. Is it even possible to save my soul? No. How can it be? Is it really true? Murderer. So you murdered my father, huh? Now you die for it. Acquired the information Claudius killed King Hamlet. Hamlet now believes that King Hamlet was murdered. So I guess they're super, super, super sure of it now because they literally confessed to it. Ophelia learns more about King Claudius. Surely you didn't forget me when you made me, Lord. If I kill him while praying, he's a lunatic. He confessed to murdering my father. I should kill him. But if I do it now while he's praying, he'll go to heaven. Ugh. I can't. I can't do it. Hamlet no longer wants to investigate King Claudius. Hamlet now wants to destroy King Claudius. I should go. Oh, I'm going to be ill. I can't stay here. It's the middle of the night. I tried to stay asleep. I really did, but I just couldn't. Not after what I saw. Claudius. So, King Claudius is a murderer. And no one but Hamlet and I know. There were whispers he'd killed his brother after King Hamlet's sudden death, but nothing with substance. Hamlet must have worked with Quince to put on a performance he thought would get Claudius to confess. But he didn't kill Claudius when he heard his confession, though I feared he might. Come to think of it, Claudius might come after us now, too. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I'm afraid. What if things get worse? How's the timeline looking? Anything on here? Nope. Oh, are we already... Wait, we're already on Saturday? I mean, we're going to go to sleep and wake up on the same day, of course. Wow, it didn't feel like that much time had passed, but I guess it did, huh? The king seeks salvation. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hamlet is in their chambers. I wonder if it's still going to prevent me from going downstairs. No. No, no, I can go anywhere I want. Okay, there's a lot of people to talk with. Should I go to Hamlet first? Sure. I don't know what I would say. Father? Hmm. He's not here. Strange. Locked chest. It's my father's lockbox. He keeps his personal items in there. Nothing but the key can open it, I presume. Father always fancied himself a scholar, I think. He certainly carried on like one. It's unclear how Father finds anything on a desk this messy. Hmm. There's a note here. A scrawled note from Laertes. Father, as I was preparing for my journey last night, I attempted to find a certain loot of mine which was the favorite among my collection. It has gone missing from its case. I'm certain Hamlet stole it. If you could somehow arrange its return during my absence, I would be overjoyed. Please don't hesitate to get Bernardo involved. All my love, Laertes. 
A missing loot. I wonder if I could find it for him. Ah, there's Peculiar Tales Volume 3. The Cleric Butler. March. This morning I awoke from a vision of God as I slept. I saw him before me in all his glory, and he spoke to me. When the dream faded, I realized my face was wet with tears. The Lord told me to enter the service of a certain Duke Eochus, living in a town near here, and to oversee the man's baptism. This particular Duke was orphaned as a child, and as such his holy education had been sorely neglected. I knew I had no choice but to obey God's will and to go seek out this man. That very dawn, I packed my things, paid the tab at my inn, and traveled over field and hill until I could reach the gate of Duke Iocus's estate. Duke Iocus is a man of notorious reputation, to be certain. Handsome, but wicked. Of course, as I have sworn a vow of modesty and chastity, I knew his wicked vices would have no influence on me. I knocked once, and, hearing a shout, interpreted it as an invitation to enter. Imagine my surprise when I found the good duke himself in the middle of beastly fornication with a young maiden, on the floor of the foyer, no less. The two of them were braying and sweating as nothing I'd ever seen. Flushing red, I, I coughed politely to make my presence known, but the duke merely rolled over and lazily extended a hand in greeting. Ah, a cleric, he boomed. What brings you to my estate? <laughs> I introduced myself and declared my purpose to him, asking if he wished to be baptized. <laughs> he roared with laughter. <laughs> what rubbish! He explained to me that he had no need for a holy man, but all the need in the world for a stalwart butler. And so, before I could think of anything better, I agreed to serve him in that capacity. I warn you, my new cleric butler, Iokas swore, I shall never believe in any god you serve. He may say this now, but I believe I can change his heart. April. My lord Iocus has kept me busy this last month. One of my continual duties is to ensure the sanctity of his personal bedchamber, especially its cleanliness, so that he might continue to seduce all manner of impressionable young folk into it at all hours of the day and night. His lust seems to know no boundaries. I find it both frightening and some matter of clinical interest to me. Today, when tidying his chamber, I thought I might leave my Bible at his bedside. Surely I thought he might read a page or two. I was right. He pushed into my room later that evening without knocking and handed the Bible back to me. What a fascinating book, he declared. Have you come to know God? Sort of. I read only the book called Song of Songs. I learned so many fascinating ways to compliment a woman's breasts. Never read anything so erotic in my life. And what of the rest of it, my liege? He shrugged. Dull dry, lacking in action, heavy-handed on miracles to service the plot. Couldn't get through half of it without falling asleep. He spun on his heel and left. May. For the last month, my lord Iocus kindly allowed me to bring a prayer group into his home. It is but once a week, on the Sabbath. Tonight, tonight's subject was on preparing oneself to enter the communion of marriage and opening one's heart to God. Three young women and three young men came to our door all of them in their finest clothing, ready to receive the word. Ordinarily, Iocus is prone to leaving home on nights like these to drink and play, but tonight he seemed compelled to linger. Not one hour in, after the wine had been served, Iocus came to me. We've nothing to serve them to eat, he fretted. Nothing but bread and cheese. What sort of meal is that? My good cleric, run into town and purchase an entire boar at once. I doned my cloak, took a satchel of gold, and started off, giving the group my apologies. About three hours later, I returned to a scene which disturbed me to my core. Around the threshold of the front door were strewn half a dozen empty wineskins. Entering the foyer, I saw two of the young women giggling and chasing after the lads, all of them naked as babes and red in the face. From upstairs, I could faintly hear the sound of distant moans. My duke, I called out. What manner of sin is going on in this home? Six voices rang out in muffled, sensual laughter. What manner indeed? I can be as specific as you like, Duke Iocas called back. 
the seventh voice barely stifling his own laugh. Though we're, uh, preoccupied. Friends, make room in the bath. I'm coming in. I think I must have gone into a dead faint then. I knelt on the floor and prayed with all my might. Later that night, Iokas burst into my chambers. His hair was wild, his eyes rolling. He was stark naked. Praise God, he shouted. I beg your pardon, I said, bleary and half awake. My dear cleric, I've seen the light. I want you to baptize me immediately, tomorrow at dawn if possible. My lord, I said in shock, what changed your mind? Iokas shook his head. I was nestled in a pile of limbs and lovemaking for hours. I thought for a moment I might die entwined like that, and I did experience a death of sorts. But then, at the moment of release, a sense of utter peace came over me, the manner of which I can hardly describe. I've never felt so content, so magical, so right. I remembered all your endlessly dull lectures about the Holy Spirit, and I knew then that surely this must be your God's way of speaking through me. This must be how you feel every day. I stared for a moment in horror. Neither of us spoke. So you'll be baptized? I ventured after a long silence. Right away, my good man. I want to be a Christian. Fair enough, I said, and went back to sleep. The Lord works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Hard to believe Father has something like this in his room. I mean, there's not, there's not going to be anything new in here. We've already been in here before. Hamlet. Ooh, the red upset. Does that mean I can't talk with him? Or maybe I shouldn't? Perhaps? He's unusually upset. I don't think he'd listen to anything I could say right now. Okay, so I just can't say anything. I was worried if I talked to him, they might try to kill me or something. I don't know. Hmm. Well, I'm definitely not going to sleep, of course. Ah, found you. It's early for you to be wandering out like this. I couldn't sleep. Do you need something? Well, something unfortunate has happened. What is it? I'm sorry, Ophelia. Y your father has passed away. He was involved in an altercation with Prince Hamlet. What? Father? How? Y you're saying Hamlet killed father? Hamlet. Hamlet wasn't in his right mind, Ophelia. He was uh, raving, insane. I've never seen him like that. I'm so sorry. It happened in the Queen's private chambers last night. I wasn't there to save him. Oh my god. Father. Why was my father in the Queen's chambers? How did all of this come to pass? At this time, my lady, I have no information. Sorry to trouble you. I felt certain you'd want to know. Please. Take me to see him. Uh, we have not been able to find the body as of yet. Uh, Hamlet has gone and hidden it somewhere. My men are searching as we speak. I think Hamlet himself is undergoing a complete break from reality of sorts. He was a good man. Nothing you might have done would have prevented this. Actually, I don't think that's quite true. Or at least, it won't be true in the future. No! I saw it. I saw him die by Hamlet's hand in my dream, Bernardo. And I did nothing. I could have saved him. But I thought it was only a dream. Ophelia! It was just a dream. Dreams aren't reality. Whatever vision you saw, it was just that. All this, I feel like I'm going mad. What am I to do now, Bernardo? I just want to be with Laertes. I need my brother. <sighs> I know, Ophelia. I know. I'll do my absolute best to bring Laertes back to Elsinore as soon as possible. And, for what little it's worth, I'm deeply, truly sorry. You and I have both known Hamlet all our lives. 
Never did we think him capable of murder. At the end of the day, I am the one wearing the armor. It was my duty to protect your father, and I failed him. Come. I have to break the news to the rest of the castle. Ophelia now believes that Hamlet killed Polonius. Ophelia learns about an event in which Hamlet presses his mother on Claudius's actions. Yeah, so in the movie, what Polonius was doing in Queen Gertrude's chamber that got them killed is they were hiding, they were hiding behind like a mirror or something in the room, basically spying on what Hamlet was going to say. I think that was in agreement with Queen Gertrude. Like, I think Queen Gertrude knew Polonius was there. But Hamlet, of course, did not. But then, somehow Hamlet found Polonius. I don't know if they just saw them or what, but found him there and killed him. I bring news. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for disturbing you. There have been some troubling circumstances. The castle is in a state of emergency until my men and I are able to investigate thoroughly. Lord Polonius died very suddenly last night as part of a deeply unfortunate accident. He died at the prince's hand. What? Oh. That boy. Now then. My men and I are still uncovering information about the event itself. I ask for your compassion for Lady Ophelia and Lord Laertes in this horrific time. Lord Polonius served the castle faithfully all his life. Whatever particulars surround his death, let us remember him as he was. A stalwart advisor to his majesty Claudius and to King Hamlet before him. Ophelia? I'm so sorry. This is rotten. All of this. Is there anything I can do for you? Anything you need? Just send word to my brother, please. It still hardly feels real, Horatio. Be kind to yourself today. Give it time. <laughs> Ophelia acquires the information. My father's murderer. Learns more about Lady Rosencrantz and Lady Gildan's turn. The character bios will be updated in the journal. awful night. Well, I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode, so I hope you've enjoyed so far. And when I return, well, there seems to be two events going on. One at the grounds between Queen Gertrude and Horatio, and one at the Great Hall with a lot of people. <laughs>